I think that the information in the museum is not really immediately accessible. Mm -hmm. I don't think one walks into the museum and absorbs that in a minute or two. I think the work will be very successful for people who have never seen it before, mm -hmm. that encounter it now for the first time in that setting. They're going to be very surprised, maybe even very angry, as to what that is doing in the museum. Freder and I were in Basel in the museum on the top floor, and we came across these little cases with small sculptures in them. But I was so taken with, with the sculptures, just couldn't leave the room. Uh, we wrote down his name to ask people who was this person and where you found him. The, the materials immediately were, were unbelievable. And the only thing I had seen like them in execution seemed to me the early Picasso Cubist sculptures. It's the only thing I could think of, and it took me a long time with a lot of questions to really begin to understand it. All I know was intuitive, and I knew that there was something there that I had to understand. And so in the beginning, those were not uh, uh, particularly valuable materials in the society. But even felt, to get felt made in this country now, what you want, any kind of felt like that, is already an enormous endeavor. Two companies wouldn't make it for us, really. They didn't want the responsibility of making felt. The purpose of the, of the shock is to stimulate, is to get people to begin to think why it looks like this. Why did the artist use these materials? What's this about? Because you just look at that and you can take it as a minimal sculpture, let's say. One of the fonts can look like a very huge minimal sculpture. You either can take it or leave it on that basis and walk right out of the room in a few seconds. But because it looks like it is, because it has so much volume about it, you are very surprised to encounter that. Why would someone use so much of that kind of material to make such a piece? And finally you begin to get into the fact that they are... Uh, uh, either a receiver of energy or a sender of energy and what kind of energy and why would one worry about sending energy or storing energy and how does that relate to human beings and our lives and finally how does it relate to the planet and resources and I mean the meanings in this are uh, very complex but the initial way to get people to react to it is just the shock value of what that looks like. The picture in the Soho News of his smiling like that is uh, people say, oh my God, there's boys just smiling, always just, mm, looking like this. Yeah. And he's used his face and his body exactly for the same shock value as he would in making any other kind of sculpture. There's no question that he's using his body to make art all the time. Whenever there's a camera clicking, Joseph goes through various things that are without question a living sculpture. And I think that's the same when he draws on a blackboard during a, um, during a lecture or a dialogue. Um, to me, it, it's not much different than Jackson Pollock dancing around a painting and dripping paint. Well, generally, they were very small audience things. His actions were not mass audience uh, activities. They were done in strange places, out-of-the-way places many times, or found spaces. He'll, he'll work anywhere. I mean, Joseph is, say, Joseph, we're going to a great hall tonight, and you'll speak, it's okay. And if you say, we're going to go to this little room, and you're going to talk to people, it's okay. And I think that in the beginning, he uh, did exactly what he tells his students. Get an idea, get a hammer and a nail, and start. And I think that's how he started with his actions and his performances. Whatever was available, whoever was interested, that was a friend, and he began. For another part of the audience who, who knows what the man stands for and what he said and what he believes and what he's done in performances, they're coming to look at these things, and that already is information that's in their head. For other people who are looking at it, there's no way that they can crack instantly standing there what some of these pieces can possibly mean. And I don't find that that's a very bad thing. I don't find that that's negative at all. I think that's very positive. That divorced from the artist lecturing, talking, performing, uh, they can have the look of leftover pieces. And the question then is how important are they as sculptures and how important are they as drawings? I can't see that one doesn't have to work a little bit to get more and more information out of it and then apply your own mind to it. Just use boys as a springboard and then take it from there. As a kind of catalyst. As a catalyst. I think that's all he's after, and I think that's what he means the work to be. Uh, I think in this country it's going to be an introduction to this kind of art. I mean, if, if we take boys seriously, which I do, and if anyone else does, um, the piece he did that the silence of Marcel Duchamp is overrated is not a small statement. This is a very important point of departure. Now the show is about to open, and I have really have no idea. I'm prepared for anything, and I expect that it will be misunderstood in many quarters.
but I visited boys many times thereafter, and uh, we continued to talk, and I made a case for his coming to the United States, which I thought was overdue and that he should do it. Uh, he was very busy in Germany. He didn't want to come during the war. I believe that he was, his English wasn't as great uh, uh, as it is now. He wasn't really uh, able to communicate so well in English language. And finally, everything did come together, and he said, I'll come. I asked him to do nothing. I just said, come, what do you want to do when you come? Would you be willing to travel? And he said, yes, I'll go anywhere. I'd like to have dialogues. And we just started. Well, I think the time is right to, to probably long overdue, to, to open up the possibility of, uh, of the kind of art that Boys is involved in, which is without question very political and uh, a kind of art that uh, um, is not something simple at all. And I think th this is the moment. There are many, many options that are there. But it's better than having a cloud. Everyone says, this work comes out of Boys. This work doesn't come out of Boys. Boys is doesn't mean that, it's not about that, or it's not important, or let's forget it, or he's German and we shouldn't pay attention to it. So I find it very easy to say many things are art that many people will say, that's not art, that, that can't be art, we won't allow that to be art. And I think if you use Boyce's definition of art, which is very open and very lovely, I think, and I, I use it all the time, art equals creativity. And if you take it a step further on some of the blackboards that he's written, creativity equals national income. I think you're really getting somewhere with that. It's a very strange paradox to say that Boyce's pieces are, in the beginning, an enigma. You don't know how to crack it. But yet Boyce wants to reach a larger audience, but maybe it's not as accessible. Uh, it's his product in the world is making art. His product is, is to do artworks. And if he's running for office, that's an artwork, too. It was a ballet to watch him install this work. Absolutely a beautiful sight. I think there's, there's another way to view the Guggenheim as, as separately from separate pieces. Mm -hmm. And I think you can view the entire installation, everything in it as one work, mm -hmm. and then take it apart piece by piece and get something from it. But you can almost tackle the whole museum. Nothing is corrected in the museum, as you know. He didn't use any artifice to correct an angle. Mm -hmm. Everything is natural in the museum as it is. And I think you almost can take the whole museum as one work. I think other artists are the most receptive. I really do feel that way. I think that would be a primary audience, and I think young people, students all over the country. I think that I've learned this from, from artists also, very importantly, from particularly a artist, an artist that I know, that art in the future should be used. People should use it in their lives, and I think that's quite spectacular. Well, I think certain, certain uh, elements are absorbers of energy and store it let's say, like a glacier. And early uh, on, boys did uh, monoprints and drawings of glaciers. And finally, this was stored energy which could be considered chaos, like, let's say, a nuclear plant. Maybe it's going to blow any minute. We don't know. And only when we, finally, when we see that, when it, let's say, melted down, when the glaciers melted down, it becomes rational. And we can begin to deal with that that is rational, like our minds might be. And some objects, some materials are the conductor of energy let's say, even between minds. But we know electricity will go through certain elements and won't go through other elements. And so one of the pieces I think that has wonderful humor at the museum is this uh, electronic device sitting on top of uh, a tallow that's plugged in and you think that energy is going in and out. I mean, you don't, you say, well, we know that energy can't go in and out of tallow. This is ridiculous. But possibly tallow is a storage of energy and we can put it in and save it and take it out when we need it and, and use it. So it's quite, uh, quite symbolic, all of that. Yeah. And I think it felt is also an insulator.